4.8 is the Data Security and Integrity Processes section of the Year 13 course. This is mainly new stuff. It is worthwhile covering the sections of data security that you've done before, but essentially this is all a big chunk of new learning. So, the first objective is about protecting the integrity of data. We need to be able to explain the special security and integrity problems which can arise during online updating of files. And the thing to remember about this is that nearly every piece of software is online nowadays. Databases, files and entire company's infrastructures are in the cloud. They're accessible worldwide 24-7. And that means that the company is vulnerable to attack even when most of the people that work for them are asleep. Because of this, we have to be really aware of the issues that come from updating files online. So with external access to files, that means that there are more things that can go wrong. Unauthorized access to files is a big problem, with hackers and those sorts of people gaining access to files that maybe they shouldn't. However, it's not just about hackers, it could just be security set up incorrectly and nobody noticing that some of our junior employees can access all the financial records. Corruption of data is a big problem. Data that's stored online and saved and updated a bit at a time can sometimes get accidentally corrupted. And if parts of data become corrupted and it's not noticed before it's backed up, then the integrity of that data is compromised. We've also got the difference between accidental and malicious data loss. Malicious being somebody purposefully going in and deleting things or removing data, whereas accidental is more about somebody who is using the data, accidentally pressing delete on the wrong file and not noticing that's a problem. Of course, it's not just the classic hacker with their hoodie up and their sunglasses on in their darkened bedroom breaking through your firewall that you have to worry about. Social engineering is actually more of a problem and that's where somebody convinces somebody else to let them gain access to a system. Concurrency is an important word here and this is where when multiple people are working on the same file at the same time, things could get out of sync. If two people download a file at the same time, make some changes and both save them, which copy of that file do we say is the master? This is where things like checking files in and checking files out becomes an important thing. Finally, we've got backups and valid backups because it's important to make sure that your backed up data is checked to make sure it's valid. The second objective is all about cryptography. Now this is a fascinating area of learning and we need to understand the need and purpose of it, describe some techniques and their role, follow algorithms that do it and compare some cryptographic methods for their strength. So let's start off with what cryptography actually is. Cryptography is where we want to transmit a message over the open internet, but we don't want somebody who snoops on it to be able to read it. We encrypt this message so that the only person that can decrypt it and read it again is the person with the decryption key. Anybody who intercepts the message en route then would have an unreadable mess. Now classically, the Caesar cipher has been used to send messages by offsetting letters by a fixed amount. Here's an example of that in action. The way we calculate a Caesar cipher is reasonably straightforward. We take our original letter, uh, we add an offset to it. So say A is one, B is two, C is three. We add that offset, we work out what that new letter is. Uh, to do that, when you get to the end of the alphabet, you'd have to use the modulus function to loop it all back to the start again. But it's easy to set up. It's very, very computationally simple. And this brings us to an argument of symmetric versus asymmetric keys. Caesar cipher is a symmetric encryption process because it uses the same process to encrypt and decrypt. It just uses it backwards. Symmetric encryption is quite easy to break with modern computer systems because they can compare values very, very quickly. Asymmetric bears thinking about because asymmetric requires a different method to decrypt it as well as to encrypt it. So it's not easy to work out just from the encrypted data what the original key was. Here's an example of something called public key encryption where you have two keys. You have the public key which is used to encrypt it and you have a private key that's used to decrypt it. Now the point of this is that we pass our data through the public key and end up with encrypted data. But at no point can we decrypt that data with the public key. If we pass it through again, it just becomes further encrypted. So you can leave that public key available to anyone on the internet without worrying. Now your private key is the only thing that can take that encrypted data and give you meaningful data. We call this a public private key pair. The public key is allowed to be on the open internet, but the private key is the thing that must remain on your closed personal device. It must remain secret. 
If that's the case, you can unencrypt any message anyone sends you with your public key. How do we compare these methods then? Well, first of all, we need to know how easy is it to break. Now, it should work on all kinds of data that corruption and the encrypted data called the cipher data or the cipher text shouldn't be any larger than the original data. Biometrics, and you've all used biometrics because it's very, very common in mobile devices. It's about measuring biologically unique features of people in order to uniquely identify them. So these are things like fingerprint, facial recognition, stuff like that. I mean, even retina, palm prints, and DNA can be used, but they're far rarer than face and fingerprints. What that gives us is high level security, but with quick access times. And mostly these things are commonplace now, thanks to mobile devices and biometric passports. It has some advantages and disadvantages. The main advantages are, well, first of all, much more secure than a password would ever be. It's faster to access that and it can't be forgotten and it can't be socially engineered. There are disadvantages though, it's unreliable sometimes. There are privacy concerns as well with some people being uncomfortable having biometrics stored in a centralized database. And also biometrics do change due to age or illness. Now, of course, it can be difficult to capture, encode and store biometric data because it's all different kinds of things. You can't just really store a picture of something and, and use that to read it back. An example of this is that facial recognition stores the distance between key points on the face, like the nose and the eyes. And fingerprints store the patterns of the whirls and loops. They're very different things that need to be stored in a computer system. So it's encoded data, it's not just an image. Processing can be done automatically and on a big scale. And this leads to privacy concerns because if facial recognition technology is applied to say the CCTV at concerts or football matches, lots of people could be picked up for minor crimes that otherwise would not be. Final section on this is malicious software and the mechanics of attack and defense. And this is where we talk about the types of malicious software. The big four are viruses, worms, trojans, and spyware, viruses, are malicious pieces of software that are designed to modify or corrupt information and they copy themselves. Worms copy themselves, but are mainly uh, there to remote control the, the computer that they infect. Uh, Trojans appear to be benign, good pieces of software, but often allow a backdoor access to a compromised system. And spyware is where opening attachments or using infected software install software that can collect and transmit data to a third party. Problematic language aside, we have three types of hackers, black hat hackers, white hat hackers, and gray hat hackers. Black hat hackers have malicious intent and don't have the permission of the companies to break into their systems. White hat hackers have a positive intent. They're being employed by the companies to find security flaws in their systems. Gray hat hackers have good intentions. They're trying to find security flaws, but don't have the permission of the companies. Penetration testing then, is the process of hacking really. It is the technical term for where we follow a process to break into a computer system. Normally we have an element of reconnaissance up front and probing of the systems to find ways in and then gaining access without the authorization of the system owner. 